Hey guys, Dr. Plague here. So, as some of my astute subscribers have noticed, I goofed up the order on my videos. So I went ahead and put number 11 up today, and 12 went up yesterday. So if you want to go back and watch them in order, be my guest. I don't try to upload videos after four 12-hour shifts in a row. That's, that's all I'm saying. Um, so today, I have something a little bit interesting for you. Um, this is my gift to you for having screwed up. Um, I have the first chapter of my new book, which is called Douglas Gage Beyond Savings, which, again, is fitting for the week because it's, it's the adaptation of Dollar General Beyond that I'm doing, which I had to change the name for uh, obvious reasons. Anyway, I hope you like it, so enjoy. In life, men are often led astray by two very specific, yet equally persuasive, organs. Kyle had been led astray by both in his 24 years of life, but in this case, it was neither. Kyle's downfall came from his bladder. He had driven his little Accord out of the parking lot of Pizza Rama, the pizza and sub shop that he worked at since high school, the need to go being little more than an annoying twinge. He had considered stepping into the bathroom before leaving, but Mr. DeMarco had been hurriedly closing up shop, and Kyle hadn't wanted to hold him up. He had finished cleaning up his area, and come out to find the old man having a cigarette beside the dumpster. These things will kill me one of these days, Mr. DeMarco said, laughing as he took another drag and letting the smoke boil out of his mouth like a fog on a pond. Hopefully not any time soon, Kyle said putting his apron in his pocket as he breathed in the secondhand smoke. See you tomorrow night, he said, as he took a step towards the parking lot. Actually, I was hoping you'd come into work tomorrow morning, Mr. DeMarco said, letting the ash drip and drift from his cigarette. Kyle stopped, sucking his teeth as he tried to find the courage he needed to decline. Actually, sir, I, I've got something I need to do tomorrow morning. I don't think I'll be able to come in before noon. "'But I need you,' the old man wheedled. "'You know just how I like the dough prepared, "'and you're so much better at it than Simon. "'If you don't come in, I'll have to do it all by myself, "'and it's so difficult with my arthritis.' "'Kyle had tried to stay strong, but he knew he would cave. "'Mr. DeMarco was a nice guy, "'but he knew just what strings to pull to get what he wanted. "'Yeah, I, I guess it's no big deal.' I can just do it some other time, Kyle said. Mr. DeMarco smiled, carefully clapping him on the back with the hand not holding his cigarette. You're a peach, Kyle. I really appreciate everything you do around here. Not enough to promote me, Kyle thought, but he kept that to himself and said goodnight. The two had parted ways after that, and Kyle had decided to wait until he got home as the pressure in his loins groaned a little. He worked less than 45 minutes from his apartment and felt pretty confident that he could make it home before he had an accident. He'd come in, take a piss, get a bite to eat, and head to bed so he could wake up early for tomorrow. Maybe he'd even have time to drop off his college application before he had to go to work. Maybe, but probably not. 25 minutes from home, Kyle realized two things. One, he'd made an error in judgment. And two, he would need to stop in the next five minutes, or things were going to get messy. Come on, he breathed, looking down the road. Something has to be open. It was nearly 11 o'clock, however, and it appeared that something did not have to be open. He had passed several restaurants, even a couple of gas stations, but everything was closed up for the night. Such was the curse of living in a small town, Kyle reflected, as he drove on. He scrunched his legs together as he tried to hold the coming tide at bay. He'd pull over to the side of the road, maybe, but the cops might see him, and he didn't really want a ticket for public urination. He started looking for a cup in the floorboard, getting desperate as he prayed for somewhere with a toilet. When he saw the sign approaching, it was like a beacon in the darkness. He was surprised to see that it was still lit up. The store in question did not, as a rule, stay open late, but he wasn't about to look a gift horse in the mouth. If there was one thing you could count on in a small town, it was the Douglas Gage, sundries and notions. 
to be there when you needed them. Most people just called it the DG, but Douglas Gage was a household name in places like this. There was a Walmart in town, of course, and a supermarket where you could get your groceries. But Douglas Gage was the kind of place you went when you needed something quick on the way home. Most times, you weren't saving any money by stopping there, but they were so numerous that their convenience couldn't be beat. The expected monolith of community currency could be seen across the street. Two gunfighters just waiting for the draw, but their sign was dark for the evening. Most people said one was hard to find without the other, and the two had a rivalry that seemed eternal. Kyle supposed in this case he'd just stop at the Douglas Gage, since the sign was still lit. If they're still open, Kyle said, I hope they haven't closed the bathroom for the night yet. He wheeled into the empty parking lot, his eyes drawn inexorably towards the sign. Douglas Gage Beyond, he read, squinting in confusion. That was a new one. He had seen most of the Douglas Gage stores transition into Douglas Gage Essentials, a fancy way of saying they now offered groceries, but he'd never heard of a Beyond before. He wondered if maybe they did automotive or something, an idea that made him laugh a little. The parking lot was still gravel, and the emptiness made him think he might be out of luck. As he approached the front, he expected to find the doors locked. He'd already figured that the sign had been left on by some absent-minded employee, and he'd find nothing but a locked door for his trouble. He hoped there weren't any cameras around back, or he was going to have to do some explaining when the cops came around to ask why he was in the gravel lot behind Douglas Gage at around midnight with his pants unzipped. To his surprise, however, the door opened, and he stepped into the store with a light tinkle of bells. Kyle was a little hesitant when he first walked in, but that ring of bells put him at ease. The inside was like any other of the three Douglas Gage stores around town, a layout as familiar as it was uniform. The personal speakers that some manager had rigged into the sound system were playing soft rock from one of the local stations, and the overhead fluorescents flickered and crackled in a way that made you think they were just about to go out at all times. The doors closed behind him with an almost ominous thump, but Kyle shook it off as his bladder throbbed again. He needed a bathroom, or there was going to be a need for a mop in pretty short order. Clean up on aisle three, he thought, and chuckled to himself. Hello, he called, looking around for someone who could give him a bathroom key. The store continued to hum placidly, the air conditioning and overhead lights the only sound to be heard. Hello? Kyle called again. He turned to the counter, but there was no one to be found. The register was empty, but he found what he was looking for sitting on the faded yellow formica. The fly swatter was pink with a white metal body, and the key hanging off the bottom looked tumorous somehow. Kyle glanced around, sure that some haggard checkout girl would come stumping out of the back to tell him she'd forgotten to lock the door, but as he reached for the key, it all seemed wrong somehow. I'm just going to use the bathroom, but I'll buy something when I'm done if I need to. I've, I've really got to go, though. No one came out to challenge him, so Kyle took the key to the little door off the main room. He groaned as he pressed the key into the lock. This was going to be a photo finish, and as he pushed the door open, Kyle expected to see a small room with a sink and a toilet inside, likely in some various state of disarray. He expected to find an employee in there, hence why no one had been at the desk, who would yell at him to get the hell out. He expected to find a dingy little closet that hadn't been cleaned in months. What he didn't expect to find was an identical store on the other side of that locked door. Kyle felt his eyebrows bunch together. What the hell was this? He looked behind him, but it was the same store he had stepped into less than a minute ago. The store on the other side looked like a mirror image, and Kyle wondered if it was some kind of optical illusion. Was he going to run into a mirror or something? He didn't know, but as his bladder groaned in protest, Kyle did know that he had to pee worse than he'd ever had to in his life, and he stepped into the bathroom without a second thought. Just as Alice hadn't known when she crawled through the rabbit hole how her life would change, Kyle had no idea how this simple trip to the bathroom would alter the course of his life forever. 
Kyle didn't encounter any resistance, and when he stepped into a brand new store, he looked back in surprise. He had stepped out of one Douglas Gage and into another. What the hell, he asked, no one in particular. He glanced around, confused, but the store looked exactly the same. Same buzzing overhead lights, same tinny music playing through the speakers, the same neat rows of products just waiting to be bought. The only difference seemed to be the front door. The glass which Kyle had been able to see out of upon entering was a black midnight. Kyle put a hand on the glass, expecting it to open, but the door refused to budge. He shoved at it, the frame jouncing a little, but no matter how much he pulled or pushed at them, they wouldn't open. It appeared that whoever had been here had locked up for the night and had forgotten to check the bathroom before going home. Kyle's bladder gave another deep groan, and he suddenly remembered why he had come here in the first place. He opened the door to the bathroom, but was, yet again, greeted with an identical store on the other side. He didn't know what this was, or how they were doing this, but he soon realized that he wasn't going to be able to use the toilet. He looked at the water fountain inside. I guess beggars can't be choosers, he said. Hello, Kyle called for what felt like about the hundredth time. He'd been searching the store for about an hour and still had yet to find anyone. He'd been hoping that maybe someone had locked the door and simply gone to the back to do inventory, but a quick search of the back showed him that no one was here. He had checked the manager's office and the break room, both devoid of people. The longer he searched the aisles, the less likely it seemed that he would stumble across some night employee with their earbuds in, and with his music turned up way too loud. Kyle resigned himself to the fact that he'd be stuck here till morning. Looks like Mr. DeMarco will have to make the dough himself, Kyle mused. I'll probably have to answer about a thousand and one questions once some manager opens up and finds me here in the morning. Speaking of Mr. DeMarco... Kyle had tried to call him, his parents, and the police about a dozen times. He didn't know what was going on, but his phone didn't seem to have any signal. The 5G worked better than usual, though, but none of his texts seemed to go through, and the phone calls just beeped and hung up. He put a few messages on Reddit to let people know that he was stuck, but what could they really do for him? At the end of the day, they were just bodies behind a keyboard, and they were probably hoping that someone would release the CCTV footage of him getting arrested in the morning, more than actually wanting to help him. Some of them had offered advice, but none of it seemed to be doing a lot of good. In the end, Kyle was just stuck. Kyle had made a sign to stick in the front window, telling the police that he was stuck in here, but who knew if it would do any good? He had decided to set up a little sleeping area in the front of the store, so whoever came in in the morning would see him right away. The last thing he needed was some beat cop getting nosy and making assumptions when he saw him curled up in his little nest. He had written up the sign to alleviate any of that confusion. He hoped they would believe him and just let him go, but it seemed more likely that he'd have to answer questions about why he had been here in the first place. People didn't usually just get locked inside a store at night. Not anymore, and they would find it pretty suspicious when the store opened and he was here. He had taken some of the food from the cooler, a sandwich, a drink, and some chips, but the self-checkout had refused to take his card. Kyle didn't make a habit of carrying more than a few dollars on him these days, so he left a note telling them that he would pay for the food when they opened tomorrow. He figured it would be just one more thing on the police report, but he was more than willing to pay what he owed before they took him to jail. He made himself a comfortable little nest and grabbed some chair cushions from the home and goods aisle and some linen from a sales rack near the door. He'd set the trash from his impromptu dinner on the counter and made himself as comfortable as he could as he prepared for bed. He had every expectation that he would loudly and angrily be woken up in the wee hours of the morning by a manager that had come in to count the safe, but at this point he just hoped the guy would believe his story and let him leave. The last thing Kyle wanted to start his day with was having to explain to the cops how he'd gotten locked in the store after an emergency bathroom trip. As he closed his eyes and tried to get ready for bed, he thought a lot about that bathroom visit. What had happened? Why did he keep coming out onto the store instead of going into the bathroom? 
He didn't know, and it made him a little uneasy. It also made him uneasy that he couldn't see out the windows. It was late, and the town he lived in was pretty podunk, but he should have been able to see some lights going up the highway. The Douglas Gage store was on the side of the busy stretch of the road, and the thought that no truck or semi had gone by all night was unthinkable. It almost felt apocalyptic, but he shook that thought away. He was being silly. This was something he would laugh about with his friends over drinks next week, and he tried to quiet his mind as he prepared to get some shut-eye. Whatever tomorrow brought, it was going to be a long day, and Kyle might as well get some sleep. The buzzing lights lulled him into dreams as he welcomed the escape from the stark white aisles of the Douglas Gage. If Kyle dreamed, he didn't remember it. He slept better than he had in years, though he couldn't say why. Officer Carl Bainbridge had been on duty for less than an hour when he spotted a car parked near the front of the Douglas Gage. This was not an uncommon occurrence. The Douglas Gage was right off the interstate, and people sometimes thought they could pull in and catch a little sleep before they started out towards wherever they were going. The higher-ups at that particular store had asked the police to keep people from doing that very thing, though, and Officer Bainbridge had become pretty accustomed to checking the parking lot. The report from his boss on the matter had been to serve the owners with trespassing notices, but Bainbridge usually just shooed them on their way. He got more than enough tickets just patrolling the highway, and he didn't need to make quotas like that. Case in point, though, there was now a 98 Honda Accord sitting in the parking lot of that humble establishment. Officer Bainbridge shone his light into the front seat, expecting to see someone asleep or wincing as they got a face full of 1,200 lumens, but the car was empty. He checked the front and back, but there was no one to be found in that particular vehicle. He swiveled the big spotlight around to the side, expecting he would find someone behind the store with their pants around their ankles and a cooling pile of crap beneath them. That would be enough probable cause to put the guy in cuffs for indecent exposure, but Bainbridge would probably let him off with a stern talking to him about taking dumps behind buildings in the middle of the night. If he was very lucky, he'd find a couple of guys out back with something that did not smell like Benson and Hedges, and that would be good enough for a decent arrest. To his absolute surprise, he found neither. The back of the Douglas Gage was barren of anything besides old Coke cans and a discarded bag of Doritos. Bainbridge made a circuit of the store, just to be on the safe side, but found no sign of anyone. As he came back to the abandoned vehicle, he scratched his head in legitimate confusion. The closest gas station was about five miles in the direction he'd come, if the fella had run out of gas and whipped into the parking lot, Bainbridge should have passed him on the way here. Carl had passed nobody going up the highway, thumbing it or otherwise. That meant that either the fella had got a lift and was just looking for an open station, or something a little more out of the ordinary had happened. Carl had been told about other cars found empty in the parking lot. Cars that never got claimed at impound, and went to auction or to the next of kin. Cars that had been found in the parking lot of this Douglas Gage as it happened. It was a little spooky to think about, and on a hunch, Carl walked up to the doors of the store and looked in. The Douglas Gage was dark inside, the night lights casting everything in a ghostly hue. He tapped on the glass, wondering if someone had gotten trapped inside, but he didn't see anyone skulking if they had. The place was as silent as a grave, and the inside looked undisturbed. He supposed if someone was hiding in there, they would get a call from the supervisor tomorrow, but he couldn't just crack the doors on a hunch. He'd have to call it in, he thought, as he walked back to the cruiser. What else could he do? Car 34 to dispatch, come in, he said as he keyed up the radio. Dispatch here. Go ahead, Brain. Honda Accord, Georgia Plates, number Echo 22308, abandoned at the Douglas Gage parking lot off 85. Carl stood silently as he waited for a response, keeping his eyes off the store. He didn't like it here. It always felt like something was watching him from those dark windows. After a few minutes of heavy clicking, the dispatch came back with it. 
Copy. Do you need tow service en route? Carl thought about it, but decided to assume the fella had got a ride to a nearby station. Negative, dispatch. I'll leave a calling card, and if it's still here later, I'll advise. Dispatch said they copied, and Carl hung the mic back up. He left his card under the windshield wiper with a message to move immediately or it will be towed, and climbed back behind the wheel of the cruiser as he drove back onto the interstate to continue his route. He really hoped the car would be gone when he drove back by a little later. He would really hate to leave someone stranded because they'd decided to park in the wrong spot. He stopped suddenly as he backed out, shining his light through the doors of the store. He'd seen something, just for a second, but it was gone now. Carl shook his head, putting the car back in reverse as he pulled away. He was getting jittery, he thought, and decided to lay off the energy drinks tonight. Hopefully, the car would be gone when he drove back by, and that would be that. It was likely he'd never have to think about it again. You're still here. Thanks so much for joining us for tonight's spooky tale. If you'd like a little bit more spooky in your life, why not click on one of the videos that appears at the end of our story? Or maybe head on over to one of our playlists where you can get your fill of spooky content. If you like your spooky a little more tactile, I've got a new book that's come out. If you'd like your own copy, there's a link below in the description where you can get your own copy of my spooky book. If you like what you see here on the channel and think you might like to support in a more monetized way, then why not come over to Patreon or become a member on YouTube? Speaking of, let's go ahead and thank our members now. Thanks to Siv Garstead and Unicorn Hollow for being our spooky ghost contributors. Thanks to Janet, Lee Kendall, Psycat, Rhonda J, Sue Casper, and Valinator for being our spooky skeleton tier contributors. And thanks to Hi Stacy, Winter, Zeronin, Stephanie Carrington, Tyler Parker, Cinnamon Fox, Sarah SMR42, Grim Reaper, and Tomboy Top Uwu for being our ghostly reader tier contributors. And a special thanks to Grim Reaper, who appears to have subscribed not just on YouTube, but also on my Patreon. Thanks, everyone. We just couldn't do the show without you, and your support is always appreciated. If you'd like to support the channel, then come on down to Patreon, or become a member on YouTube. Spooky Skeleton Tier Contributors, that's our $5 tier, get their spooky 12 hours early, at 8.30 a.m., as opposed to 8.30 p.m., my time, of course. And while Ghostly Reading is a only a tier that's available on Patreon, you get a signed copy of my book anytime I write one on your doorstep in hopefully a timely manner. If you'd like a book, we have many on Amazon. I've got links below if you'd like to follow those. Um, should get you to my page so you can buy any one of my eight books I believe we're up to now. I'm sure they'd look really nice on your shelf and I'll sign them for you if you can find me out in the wild. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.